first week we focused on the characteristics of the Holy Spirit. And we talked about four characteristics of the Holy Spirit. Um, the first one was intellect, right? And uh, we discussed how the Holy Spirit and the thoughts of man are known only by the Spirit of God. And it takes a personality to know these certain thoughts. We talked about feelings, um, that the Holy Spirit um, can be grieved. How many of you know that? How many of you have ever witnessed or experienced the grieving of the Holy Spirit? Maybe in our lives or maybe in a, a, a situation or a, a travesty that, that happened or took place when you sensed the gravity of what was taking place and how it simply grieved the Holy Spirit because of what was happening. The next characteristic of the Holy Spirit that we touched upon was that the Holy Spirit has a will. 1 Corinthians 12, 11 says the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts to each as he wills, okay? And he has his own will. And then the last um, characteristic of the Holy Spirit is the actions of the Holy Spirit, which led us into week two. The actions of the Holy Spirit, as we have seen throughout Scripture, have been as such. Number one, that he speaks. Number two, that he testifies. He bears witness in the world. Number three, the Holy Spirit teaches. John chapter 14, verse 26 says that he teaches us all things and remind, reminds us of everything that he wants to bring back to our, our hearts. Um, the fourth is that he convicts. When we're sensitive to the Holy Spirit and we're growing in our relationship with God, the Holy Spirit is the one who brings conviction into our lives. He brings us conviction, which is a good thing. How many of you know that conviction is good? God doesn't take a whole bunch of guilt and then heap it on us and then just leave, it there, leave, it, leave us there to wallow away in it. No, but he does bring conviction and he does remind us, okay, of the things that he wants us to do the ways that he wants us to be, the things that he wants us to think, the ways that he, he wants us to say, okay? So let's be reminded of that. The Holy Spirit also intercedes. He intercedes on behalf of us um, and goes to the Father and to the Son. He guides us into truth according to John chapter 16 and Acts chapter 16. He reveals God's word to us. We read that in 2 Peter Chapter 1, verse 21. The Holy Spirit can also be, te be tested. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira tested the Holy Spirit, and they saw that in the end, it was not a good thing. Their lives were required of them. The Holy Spirit can also be lied to, according to Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Isaiah 63, verse 10 says that he also can be grieved. And we discussed that in the, his characteristics. But in Isaiah 63, it kind of fleshes that out a little bit more for us. Also in Acts chapter 7, the Holy Spirit can be resisted. Okay? Just as the Holy Spirit is a person, people can be resisted. We can kind of ignore. Well, just this week, my wife and I sent a text message to somebody, and they ignored us. And we had to show up in person to have that conversation, and it was not a good one, right? And just as we can ignore one another and resist one another, you know what? We can also resist the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit will not force himself upon us. We want you to, to understand that. We want you to know that. And the last one is that he can be insulted and blasphemed, according to Hebrews chapter 10. Then in the third week, we discussed the attributes of the Holy Spirit. So we, we talked about the divinity of God, the divinity of the Holy Spirit. The first attribute of the Holy Spirit was that he is eternal, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. We also know that one of the other attributes of the Holy Spirit is that he is all-knowing or omniscient, omniscient. The third attribute of the Holy Spirit is that he is all-powerful or om omnipotent. We see that by the power of the Holy Spirit, he impregnated Mary. It said, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit came upon her so that there is nothing that is impossible for God. Amen? 
The last attribute is that the Holy Spirit is everywhere or omnipresent. The Holy Spirit is not only in our lives. He's not only God, but he is everywhere in the world. He is acting in the world right now. God is moving in the world. And, and we, we stress this point. Watch this. The Holy Spirit moves even on individuals that are not believers. Because God desires the hearts of all of his children. But not all children become his redeemed children. They are his children by creation. They are his children by, by virtue of, of, of humankind multiplying and taking dominion over the earth. We are God's creation. He created Adam and Eve and so on and so forth. And then the Holy Spirit does the works of God. Creative power and putting everything into being, into motion. Regeneration. We're renewed by the Holy Spirit each day. The Holy Spirit also gave us the scriptures according to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. And the Holy Spirit was involved in the resurrection of Jesus. It was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus up from the dead. Amen. And then last week we discussed um, the person of the Holy Spirit through symbols. Um, God communicates to us through language. We, we, dis, we, we talked about just as children, how children begin to form a language to communicate with you know, the rest of the world, um, we also learn how God communicates to us through symbols. One of the symbols, does anybody um, um, remember any of the symbols of the Holy Spirit? What, what's, what was one? Fire, wind, good. What else? Water, what else? Oil, yes. The dove, exactly. The, and seal, right? Not the ar, ar, ar kind of seal. But the type of seal that's stamped. And it, the um, Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, um, chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, that the Holy Spirit is, uh, his, he, we bear his mark. We bear the seal of the Holy Spirit upon our hearts and upon our lives. So that as we go into the world, guess what? We also get it. We also have the responsibility. I'm going to say that. We have a responsibility, responsibility to bear witness to the fact that God resides in us. God lives in us so that we're responsible for the way we talk. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We're responsible for the things that we do. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We're responsible for the things we don't do that we should be doing because the Holy Spirit Witness is placed upon our hearts. It's like it's stamped. It's our lives have the guarantee and seal of God and his presence in our lives. Okay, we're all caught up. Now we're in week five. Are you ready? Are you ready, church? Okay, if you would all bow your heads right there where you are, would you join me in prayer? We're going to start off in lesson five of the person of the Holy Spirit. And tonight we're going to be talking about experiencing the Holy Spirit. Father God, you've called your people to come together and our response when we come together should be yes and amen. Today, Father God, as we continue to learn and grow in the knowledge of who you are and how we bear witness to the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Father God, I pray, I pray now, Lord Jesus, that we would begin to put the Holy Spirit into motion in our lives. Holy Spirit, we pr I pray that you would begin to work in our lives. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would begin to open our hearts, that you would open our minds, that you would open our lives so that the world might see that we are alive, that we are filled with your presence and with your power. Lord Jesus, all of this so that we might glorify the Son of God. All of this, Father God, so that Jesus might walk with us, so that Jesus may, may take up residence in our lives. We pray all these things today in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen and amen. Give God a hand clap tonight. Give God a hand clap tonight. Let's thank God for his goodness. Amen. So in the last several weeks, we've been discussing a whole lot of head knowledge. And, and, 
And how many of you know that head knowledge is only a part of us growing in Christ? Head knowledge is only a part of what God wants to do in our lives. But along with the head knowledge, along with receiving and taking in information and, and understanding the descriptive ways that God is communicated to the world, it's also very important that we know and that we begin to experience the Holy Spirit in our lives. It's kind of like, okay, enough talking. Let's now begin doing. Let's begin to experience God's work in our lives. Let's begin to experience the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need to experience the Spirit of God. Just as it's important to be organized, prepared, and highly structured, the church must be careful not to rule out the role of the Holy Spirit in its undertakings. Let me pause there for a moment and, and ask this question. How many of you in here really enjoy or are really good at being organized? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. I'm glad. I'm glad to see that. Some of us are very highly structured individuals. Okay, I grew up in a home where my dad was always gone. He was on the go. He was so busy, wrapped up in teaching at the seminary and pastoring the church and traveling around the country. Mom was left to, to kind of raise the three of us, oftentimes all by herself. Of course, with the whole Canales Village and the rest of you, if you were ever around way back when. And my mom, she would be taking us from one place to the next. Boom, 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 boom. Did you know in the beginnings of this church, we owned a whole bunch of church vans? And the church vans would go to all of the cities around the South Bay. One would go to Harbor City, one would go to Wilmington, one would be going to San Pedro. And then everybody in Carson, you better find a way. After Royal Rangers and Missionettes and Wednesday night Bible studies, Guess what? My mom was one of the church van drivers. And guess where we, we were? In the back. Crammed up with all the rest of our, our knucklehead buddies. Coming down on 22nd Street in Pedro, hoping that the brakes would just work. <laughs> Coming off of Gaffey. How many of you know about 22nd Street? So we did not grow up in a highly structured home. Whether you believe that or not, it's, it's on you. But I'm telling you, we had to figure it out some way, somehow, we got it done. And we all seemed to manage and be okay by God's grace. Only by God's grace. Only by God's grace. We get home at 10.30, 11 o'clock on Wednesday nights. So I have to wake up and go to school, be there on time on Thursday. Most of the time, we were not. My mom was the one making us late. I'm telling her my mom. But on the other hand, my wife, Boomy, is the complete opposite of my mom. Boomy is like, she's a machine. The baby's in bed by 7 o'clock on the dot. Elisha, 11 years ago when he was born, Boomy had him on a program. Boom, 7 o'clock, he was in bed, and she didn't leave the house. That's why every time there was a, a, a one-year grace period, that's why you don't see Boomy here on Wednesday nights, because she says, nope, give me a year and a half to two years. I'm going to get Lola right, and then I'll be back to, re to assume my, my role. I said, don't worry, baby, you're doing enough. Make sure our babies, make sure our babies have what they need and they're healthy. And our baby sleeps 12, hour, 12 hours at night. So thanks to mama. Thanks to mama. But as organized and prepared and as important as being structured is, and even in a church, as structured and organized as we would love to be and like to be, the church without the ability to make place and to make room for the Holy Spirit is a church that is not going to go far and do the true work of God. Because we are going to be so focused on doing our thing. We're going to be so focused on our agenda that the word of God, very, the word of God that he has given to us very well might wait, make its way outside of those walls. The word of God would not be protected if we as the people of God do not make room for the Holy Spirit in our lives 
And guess what? We are missing out on a very crucial and important part of our relationship with God. Let me put it for you in a practical way. Five years ago, my wife and I bought a home in Long Beach. And in the process of buying this home, they had just tightened up all the requirements for buying homes and, 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 and getting loans and, and lending and everything like that because of how the market had plummeted back in 2008. How many of you remember that? My wife and I, in, in 2006, before everything came to a head, we got a, a zero, um, zero down loan. And we were like, oh, man, this is like heaven. Until all of a sudden you start learning about the details of how all these loans were structured. Countrywide, Bank of America, you name it, everybody was in a tizzy except Chase Bank because they held to their standard. So fast forward five years ago, my wife and I are buying this house. We had an advisor who was saying, man, you want to get a house in this market, you're going to have to be super, super aggressive. Well, what's it going to take? You're going to need to put this money down. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to be really pushy. You're going to have to just, bull, just, just bulldoze your way into every deal. You're going to have to just almost break down walls and make sure that, that the sellers, all right, know that you're knocking and that you're an offer they can't refuse. And I remember hearing all of this. And my wife and I, without taking the time to invite God into this process, pay attention. My wife and I, without taking the time to pray, Okay, to listen to one another, to seek others counsel and to allow God to be a part of this process, jumped into this whole situation, this whole ordeal. It was the most stressful time of our marriage five years ago trying to buy this home. We put in offers in different homes in different places and those fell apart. We pulled out of two different deals and we're looking at each other, at each other saying this. It, it's not supposed to be like this. It was so stressful. And then we got into this, this home right here and putting an offer down in Long Beach. And all of a sudden, it's like God just hit the brakes. And he goes, you, you have not learned your lesson. He's like, Arr! we tried to force a square peg into a round hole. Do you know, do you know that, that metaphor? We were trying to make something work that wasn't meant to work that way. But we were looking at all the different ways to make it happen. In the end, we got the home, but at the expense of being stressed out, God definitely taught us a lesson. We didn't get the loan approved until longer than 60 days. 60 days. They combed through everything. And we remember it was as, a, as if God was saying, all right, you're going to get this house, but I'm going to make sure that you remember that you did not go about this the right way. You did not involve me in this process. You got ahead of me, is what God was saying. And sometimes, you know what? God will let us go and, and make up our minds and, and charge ahead and make decisions and make purchases and make this. And, and you know what? If we're fortunate, if we're lucky, I'm going to say lucky. If we're lucky, God will come to our rescue and how put that thing to back together for us. I'm not going to say because it if, we're, we're, if we're blessed. Because God's just like, well, you were on your own all along right there. If we're lucky, God will come in and say, you know what? You really messed this one up. There's a story in the Bible about one of the most prominent men of faith in the book of Genesis who got ahead of God. Anybody know who I'm talking about? Somebody say Abraham. Abraham got ahead of God. God promised him his son. He told Sarah, you're going to have a son. And they laughed, both laughed at God. And they got ahead of God. They went, in, they went off and got the purchase before they should have gotten the purchase. They went off and got, did this before they should have gone, went, went and got that. You ever make a purchase and later you regretted it? That's because we didn't consult God. We went and did it and then we said, God, would you bless it now? He's just like, bless what? You blessed it yourself. Right? It's like if we go and blow our own trumpet, blow, it's like one of those, you go and blow your own horn, 
and, and, and talk about how great and how good you are, guess what? You don't need any props from me from heaven. You know, if you would have just stayed humble and kept quiet and kept doing what I, was t- what, I, what I was telling you to do, guess what? You had so much more in store, but I had to withhold that from you. We get ahead of God. Abraham, instead of waiting on God's promise for his son Isaac, got ahead of the game, had a son with his maidservant, his wife's maidservant, Hagar. So they had a son named Ishmael, who ended up being, historically and biblically, ends up being one of the biggest divisions, one of the biggest, um, you know, chasms in all of the Bible. And heartache and pain and suffering and brokenness. All because Abraham got ahead of God and did not allow God's work to take the due process, the the necessary time. So, are we all on the same page? Watch what it says here. If it wasn't for God's direction, we would all be in a heap of trouble. So we need to make room for the Holy Spirit in our plans. Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Let me read that again. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. So in other words, just as we need to be organized and prepared and very structured, making sure that we don't take for granted these very things that are important, we need to make sure that we consult God. We need to make sure that we are allowing the Holy Spirit to participate in every venture, everything that we do, big and small. Big and small. So that God sees our plans. And then he says, okay, well, because you involved me in this process. And because you waited for me to give you the green light. Whether it's through signs. Whether God sends an angel to you. Maybe God, somebody says something to you. That that lets you know that it's okay to go forward with that thing that you're praying about. Or whether you're reading the Bible. And God speaks to you through the word of God in a story. And then the Holy Spirit just goes, goes ahead and tells you, yes, now go. God speaks in so many different ways. You may be driving and all of a sudden see a sign and say, wow, that is the Holy Spirit. That is God telling me that I have the green light to proceed. Had a friend who's going through a really difficult time back east. Got fired from his job. He's been on hiatus for a whole year, kind of been blackballed in the market that he's in. He said, this has been the most difficult year that I've ever gone through as a man. He said, but I I would do it all over again if, if I had to. He said, I finally threw my my hat in the ring again to see if there was any uh any takers, threw his bait in the water, see if there was any fish on the lot out there that would tag his line. Looked at a potential job interview. The person talked to the individual that connected him up and said, oh yeah, I'd love to talk to him. He's got a great resume. Why did he get fired? He got fired for X, Y, Z. Oh yeah, he didn't do this, that, that, or the other. No, he didn't. Oh yeah, I'd love to talk to him. Get him in touch with me. We end up talking on the phone. I said, hey, you know what? I believe it's a, it's a sign from God. Not that you're going to get that job, but it's a sign from God because it's the first time that you actually threw your name out there onto the market to see what people were saying about you and what they thought about your former situation. This is a sign that God is letting you know that he's beginning to open the doors and prepare the way for some great things in store for you. It was a wonderful reminder to a great brother in Christ. And God is the same way with us. Proverbs 16, 9 says, a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So go ahead and be organized, be prepared, be as structured as you want. And then guess what? Know that sometimes God is going to redirect your steps just a little bit differently and be okay that God may bring you to that end, that end goal and that, that purpose, that vision, that dream that you're going after. But sometimes your path may be different from the next person's path. 
that is also headed to that, in that same direction. And it's okay for the believer to be open to God's leading and directing you in a slightly different way. Because if you're in God's will and you know God has called you to something and you know God has placed a passion and a purpose in your life and in your heart, then guess what? He's going to see to it that you succeed. The Holy Spirit is going to see to it that we succeed. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. That's kind of like what we're saying here. We go and do whatever we want at our own whim because our heart is telling us to do it. It's the worst thing this next generation, you know, is growing up listening to and hearing on the songs and, and you know, all of this, this agenda, you know, a liberal agenda on university campuses that are driving wedges between students and their parents. Think about it. All kinds of nonsense and propaganda that, that, are, that are being pushed onto this next generation. And this next, next generation, if they're not careful, guess what? They're just going to go and do whatever their heart tells them to do. That could be some of the worst advice you could ever give an individual. Just do what your heart tells you to do. We know from the word of God that our heart is wicked above all things. Our heart our feelings and our emotions serve our very own purpose, and that's it. No other purpose, nothing else, just to make us happy. But being faithful to God and being obedient to God and being patient and waiting on God. Somebody say waiting on God. Waiting on God requires the role of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That's the Holy Spirit, and us experiencing the Holy Spirit in our lives is waiting on God. What does Isaiah 40, 31 say? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They will, you, they will run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Wait on the Lord. Wait alongside the Holy Spirit and he will direct our paths. Four ways that the church experiences the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. Philippians 2.2. The Holy Spirit creates unity without producing uniformity. Philippians 2.2 says, Then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. The Holy Spirit, you guys, creates unity without producing uniformity. What does that mean? It means he brings us together and God recognizes the diversity of, or the varieties that is present in the body of Christ. The Spirit allows us to serve and to move and operate in our gifts, in our strengths, and in who we are as individuals. Your personality was given to you by God. God does not want to change your personality. God wants to change our character. God wants to change and transform our character the character is what, what represents us. It's where we get the word cara. People see our face. Our character is what people see. Our personality is who we are. God uses our personalities for his kingdom. God uses our personalities. God uses your, 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 um, your, your being an extrovert for his purposes. If you're a talkative person, God's going to use that. If you're a studious person, God's going to use your, your studious abilities. If you're, you know, gifted in a certain area, God wants to use you in that particular gift. And he does not want to cause uniformity where everybody just has to come under a big, huge blanket, you know, type of statement and all be the same. Cookie cutter mold, cut from the same cloth. No, I'm a coach. I coach everybody differently according to their abilities, according to their makeup, according to their make. I can't teach a big, huge, tall, lanky kid how to hit the same way I teach a little shorter dude with short arms and, you know, short limbs. It's completely different. It's completely different. Right? We don't all raise our children exactly the same way, right? We raise them with the same principles, 
but then we treat, treat them differently according to their personalities. And that's the same way with God. God deals with us according to the, the way he made us, and that is beautiful. The Holy Spirit ministers to us the life of Christ, who is the source of unity. Somebody say amen. amen. Number two, the second way that the Holy Spirit um, was experienced by the church, as we read about in the book of Acts, is that the Holy Spirit taps the potential in our lives that no one else or nothing else can reach. So when we give our lives to Jesus and God begins to transition us from the world into the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit, you guys, equips us spiritually and adapts our gifts, passions, and talents in a way where we serve the Lord and where, in a way where service to the Lord is, is the primary purpose, the primary function, whether it's through humility, faithfulness, or service unto God, we begin to live to the greatest potential, the greatest you that you can be. The Holy Spirit was given to us so that you can become that person, so that we can reach that full potential that Christ has already set in our hearts and in our lives and without God, guess what? We deviate from the plan that God initially, initially and originally had purpose for us in our lives. But thank God for his mercy. Thank God for his grace. Thank God for his patience. Thank God for forgiveness. Thank God for his regenerative power in our lives. Thank God for his ability to renew us by his spirit and transform us into a different man. Transform us, you guys, into a different woman, wh wh whatever the case may be. Praise the Lord. Number three, the Holy Spirit leads us into two dimensions. And this is how the church experienced the Holy Spirit, especially as we read about in the book of Acts. But also, this is very applicable to each and every one of us, not only in the body of Christ, but in our own individual lives. Number one, he leads us deeper into a loving and sweet relationship with God. So in other words, the Holy Spirit, number one, is helping us grow. The Holy Spirit is, is causing us to grow. Just like my boys now are starting to sleep longer and not, not so, you know, interested in bouncing up and watching cartoons at 5 a.m. in the morning. Now, now, because I got them out there running hard on the track and, and training hard and studying hard and, and serving Jesus hard and loving family hard, and being good, obedient boys, and doing all their chores, picking up their room, cleaning up their room, putting things away, learning how to do dishes, learning how to do other chores. Guess what? They're sleeping longer and longer in, at night. We're wearing them, them out. I was going to say something else I can't say in church. We are wearing them out, and they're growing. And I'm so proud. I looked at my son Judah today. They did a, they did a three-mile workout yesterday at practice. I mean, th the coaches took, took it to them, their track team. Such a competitive, such a difficult workout. And I just looked at, down at my son today as I was hustling over here from Linwood to get here by 7. I drive him over there before church, and we get right here. We pull up, drop him off at Royal Rangers, and, and then let's go. So don't give me no excuses. You're tired. Don't give me no excuses. You got homework. So do we. And we, we seem to manage. Watch this. I looked down at my boy, and he was right there in the passenger seat. He was exhausted right now before he went to Royal Rangers. I said, son, I'm so proud of you. You're growing so much. I know you've had some complaining and some hemming and hawing. And all, I don't know how many times you quit mentally. How many times you say, I quit, Dad. No, you ain't quitting, boy. I'm so proud of how far you've come. I imagine how strong your legs are. You could probably run five, six miles right now without stopping. I just, I, just, I just had to just love on him and tell him how amazing he is. And God is doing the same thing with you and I. It doesn't just mean that we have some kind of deeper spiritual knowledge that sets us apart and makes us better than anybody else. No, but it's that God is bringing us into a greater understanding for a new life so that he can conform us into the way that we need to know God and see the world. God begins to change the way we, see, we think. God begins to change the way we see things. Before we used to make excuses and, and we used to fall for everything, 
Before we used to, oh, point the finger because it's their fault and their fault and their fault and this teacher's fault and that teacher's fault until we stop and the guy begins to change our hearts and say, no, it's your responsibility. You need to take responsibility for this. Josh, your son is the one who's getting into trouble in this situation. It ain't the teacher. You need to go up there and have a, a conference with all three of you and get this thing squared away. God begins to change the way we think instead of constantly pointing fingers at the world and never taking responsibility for the things that God wants us to learn and grow up and become mature disciples and followers of Jesus Christ. And the second way that he leads us is that he leads us into the world. Before we go into the world, we should make sure the Holy Spirit goes with us. According to Acts chapter 2 and John chapter 20, both point to the Holy Spirit being a part of the disciples going into the world. So before the, whole, the, the disciples went, before Jesus sent the disciples, he said, now receive the Holy Spirit. Receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for power and to now preach, to go and preach. You guys, when we, when we receive the Holy Spirit, you guys, when we invite Jesus to come into our heart, he begins a greater work in our lives. And then there's also another experience, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit also that, that empowers us, you guys, and begins to bring forth the spiritual gifts and the spiritual fruit that are waiting to be unlocked and unleashed in our own lives. As Isaiah worshiped the Lord, he heard God ask him, who will go into the world and speak of his goodness? And Isaiah said, send me. It was during a time of worship that Isaiah had his hands lifted high and he was praising and he saw a vision from God and he said, send me, God, I'll go. How many of you know, want God to go before you? How many of you want a feeling of the Holy Spirit, an infilling of, of the Holy Spirit in your life before you go out into the world? I know I do. And the last thing is this, the last way that the operating presence of the Holy Spirit is revealed in our lives is this, is that the Holy Spirit, you guys, waits to be received. He waits to be received. He waits until we invite him, you know. He waits until we invite him to come along with us. Because as a person, we can resist him, can't we? Even as Christians, we can resist the Holy Spirit. We can hold him off. We can keep him at bay. We can say, no, no, don't, I, you don't, no. But the Holy Spirit seeks an invitation into your life. The Holy Spirit seeks an invitation even for greater things in our own lives. Even to, to the point of being open to the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you guys, it requires an invitation. It requires a sense on behalf of God that we're wanting to receive the Holy Spirit into our lives. And I, I know the saying goes, well, not all Christians have all gifts and not everybody speaks in tongues. That's true. But it's not a reason to say I am open to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit in our lives. That is to say that I would love to receive the baptism of the Holy, Holy, Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, if God would like to bless me in that way, if God would like to empower my life. Because we don't, we don't even know what gifts God has in store for us unless we've experienced the Holy Spirit in that new way. So to, for someone to say, I don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's a sign of pride. It's a sign of pride for somebody to say, well, I don't need the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because it's clear in Scripture that every believer throughout the book of Acts received the baptism of the Holy Spirit on both Gentiles and Greeks alike. I also would like to say this. For anybody that has the baptism of the Holy Spirit to say that or think that they are better than somebody that does not have the baptism of the Holy Spirit is also pride. Because the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not re a requirement for salvation, where some doctrine and some Christian faiths teach 
That's not biblical. It's not biblical. It's not requirement for salvation. But it is a blessing from God to edify the church, to edify the believer, to edify one another so that we can bring glory to who? To God. So we can bring glory to Jesus Christ. So if you have one camp over here that says, well, I don't need to receive. That's okay. You may not need. But that does not mean that you should not be open to receive. And to the camp over here that says, every believer must have. We need to find the happy medium, which says, if God has baptized you with his Holy Spirit, praise the Lord, operate in the gifts, operate in the strength and in the power that God wants to unleash in your life and in your as my father coined today a new term, your pneumosphere. Right? And to, 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 to one or to somebody who says, well, I've never been baptized in the Holy Spirit and I don't need to receive the baptism, I say this, hey, let's meet over here with folks who, who have received it and are okay if you've never received it and you never receive it, that's okay too. God bless you. God loves you just like he loves me, just like he loves everybody else. Just like he, he wants to bless every single believer. But do not, what I'm saying is, let us make sure that we are not closed off to it and let us not be puffed up or arrogant just because we may have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So let us all remain humble and just as Paul told us in Philippians chapter two, verse two, that the Holy Spirit would bring us in one accord and give us the same mind, Joe, the same spirit that we might bring glory to his son, that we might represent and bear witness to the presence and to the work of the Holy Spirit among us. <laughs>